My name is Bill Gallagher, Scaling Coach, host of the Scaling Up Business Podcast. You can find hundreds of episodes now on leadership and scaling your business all at scalingcoach.com. We've got downloads of all the tools, show notes, the things that our guests talk about, all that in the episode pages at scalingcoach.com. You can get a free copy of the book, Scaling Up There. Just pay the shipping and handling. All that, scalingcoach.com. These Getting Real episodes are a deep dive into a conversation with an entrepreneur about their journey in and their development as a leader and growing the business, how they grew the business and how it changed them in the process. So we'll explore uh, in just a minute with Sean Gannett. Um, I want to remind everyone that our Getting Real episodes are sponsored by the Bay Area EO chapters, commonly known as EO. It's a member-led organization, and it's really the best place for entrepreneurs to meet, connect, learn, and grow uh, together in their businesses. I've been a member for now about 21 years with several different companies, and uh, I'm really proud to be a member. Uh, it's been such a great resource and great community in my life. Um, our members in the Bay Area chapters and around the world are connected to each other. And, uh, and really happy to connect with each other. So there's more than 14,000 around the world, whole world of entrepreneurship, in addition to whatever is in your neck of the woods. If you'd like information about what goes on in EO or to apply to join or any of that, uh, just go to eonetwork.org. That's the place to get all the information or to apply eonetwork.org. So listen in now as we talk with Sean Gannett about growing SFG and all about his business and everything there is. Welcome to the show, Sean. Thanks, Bill. Nice to be here. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you as well. So um, Sean's in New York today. And uh, while we're talking, I'm on the West Coast, so we're bookending the country, right? And uh, um, he's owner of this uh, company called SFG Productions. And they really help tell stories to organizations and companies and events and that kind of thing. Started as a film producer. I'll let him tell more about it, but that's the world of what we're doing. So talk to us. Let's start first with that kind of thing. Why did you become an entrepreneur? What made you think? Did it start very early? Did it start later? Where did you first kind of become an entrepreneur? What was that all about? Well, uh, I was forced to become an entrepreneur. Uh, it was not on my radar. So I've been freelancing. I've been making under your head. Uh, what's that? <laughs> a gun to your head. <laughs> exactly. No, it's like I, I was. I was making movies. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, at a certain point, you have like a big client, and they say, "Hey, you need to be a company. We can't hire you unless you're a company." And mm -hmm. uh, so I incorporated because it, there was like a gun to my head in the form of a you know a bunch of dollar bills, and uh, so I formed the company. I didn't realize that it was going to take me on such a crazy journey. Um, so I incorporated, but then after that, it was really just a matter of, oh, I'm getting, I'm getting, uh, I'm starting to see some scale here. I'm starting to get too many calls for me to answer on my own. I'm going to have to build some sort of company around my, my, the work that I do just so I can handle my client base. Um, and if you're in that freelancer world, it's like, you, you hate to say no. I mean, you say no to a client and then it's. You think to yourself, when what, are they going to come back? Are they going to call? What, what if the next guy, you know, charms them in a way I didn't? You know, so mm -hmm. uh, really uh, trying to maintain my client relationships and maintain, you know, uh, that over time is why I started the company. So, what has been your lucky break? Was it just at the inception, or was there something else that kind of got you moving? Yeah, I mean, my lucky break. Wow, I, it has to have been the first the, the first job I had was the the luckiest break ever. Um, I was called in for an interview with the TED conferences about eleven years ago, and they at the time, you know, everybody knows now what a TED talk is, but back then it was kind of they were just sort of starting to really blow up. It was uh, early on. Sorry, uh, you can hear like the New York jungle outside. Um, so, uh, it was kind of early in their career and in their, in their trajectory with uh, online video, they were about five years into online video at that point. And, um, they were looking for somebody to help produce a conference, uh, in the Galapagos on a boat. And, uh, and the, sorry about that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I hate cool places. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I was like, I was kind of like, 
I was kind of like, okay, no matter what happens, I've got, I've got to find a way to get this job. You know, like I've got, I've got to just make this work. And so, Mm -hmm. um, I kind of, uh, I embedded with the company. I took a, I went to sort of master class on Ted on how to produce those shows. And it turns out that Ted produces like sort of best in breed conferences, video productions. And, uh, Mm -hmm. as I was prepping that show, I learned so much and, uh, that was a real jumping off point for me. And the people that I met through the TED organization um, were just so beautiful that they helped sustain my career for uh, years afterwards. And that's how I started to build the company, um, just through through like sort of an organic network. You know, I, uh, so TED is now infamous um, and has spun off TEDx. And, um, but I think even the TEDx ones have... Um, a couple of things that are really great. One, there's a there's a focus on um, good speaking, good storytelling or whatever it is. Right. So they train them, they coach them, they give them feedback on the whole thing. They really work on developing the speaker's presentation. And it's tight. It's not like a two hour presentation on something that should have been done in five kind of thing. Right. So they focus on, and then there's really good staging, good lighting, good video. They capture, they go, you know, they get great video and great staging. So it sounds and looks good later when you're watching it, not like some conferences and there's like one camera in the back that, you know, <laughs> yeah. Amen, Bill. I mean, a wide you're, shot. you're, 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 you're speaking my language, brother, because like, that was the kind of stuff that I was so attracted to. You know, they, they were very much anti-conference. They were, they, they had this feeling of let's make this cinematic, like let's tell stories. And, uh, it was that sort of mindset that really clicked for me, you know, was it, which allowed me to take that, um, that different move from th- that transition of like storytelling in film to storytelling on stage and through this, uh, through this conference experience. That's really cool. So what then, if that was your lucky break, what's been your, uh, your biggest challenge, your, your, like the, the, it could be, you're still dealing with it, but what, what do you think has been the biggest thing so far? Um, I think the consistent challenge for me was just how do I scale responsibly? I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, um, seems to be like what everything you're talking about, you know, it's like your whole show is about this. Right. But, but like when I was growing as a, as a business, I felt like I was holding onto a balloon and it was just taking off and I was holding on for dear life and I was sailing away and, you know, things are going great, but what happened? Like there was no foundation. There was no, uh, there was no foundation below me. Right. Um, and so finding a way to, uh, to build a ladder to the balloon, uh, so that there was, uh, so that there was, there were stilts underneath me. Like there was a feeling of some sort of support. Uh, it's now feeling much more like scaffolding and stilts, um, and the, uh, that, that was really the big, that was really the big journey for me. And that was a really big part of why I joined EOA and, um, continuing to be a part of the, part of the organization. So for the listeners, EOA is the accelerator program for the EO organization. It's a program that helps people get over their first million in sales typically. And uh, it uses all of the core pieces of scaling up. Not everything that we do. I mean, we work with companies getting them over a billion and beyond, but um, but a piece of it and applied appropriately to the stage, not the startup stage, but that first bit of growth that gets them over to it starts to feel more like a real company. There's a real team. There's a real th- something. There's some continuity there. And that's typically what happens is people get to the first million in sales. Um, so it's been really great. And I've been involved, deeply involved with that program for a number of years now. I work with Vern on curating the content and training the trainers around the world for it. So um, you're in that program. Now, how long have you been in the program? Uh, I was in the program for about two years when I crossed the, uh, when I crossed the uh, million dollar mark and yeah. And then, but I crossed right on time. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. Um, and, uh, but I crossed it like as the pandemic hit. And so, yeah. uh, I hung tight, uh, in the program for, uh, through the pandemic. <laughs> so I was thinking maybe now is not the time to make the leap. Uh, to the next level. And uh, it's been a really good support network throughout the uh, through the last uh, 12 months. It's been kind of incredible. Well, it's time to have you uh, join EO and then become a coach in the program and, and help some others through. And, and you will just simply deepen your own work and development as you start to work with others through the program because you'll start to see that gap. But if you 
are asked then, what part of the accelerator program has made the biggest difference for your business? What was your business like before? How did you apply it? What is it like today? Yeah, I always, I always like to point to you that first day that I was at EO, uh, an EO learning day. Uh, it was an yeah. EO learning day and it was people day. And, you know, people say this all the time, but it's like taking a sip from a fire hose because you're just like blasted with all this incredible information when you, when you, right when you first start up, I couldn't believe there was this like sort of curtain being pulled, pulled back to uh, reveal all of these insights. And I, that first day at People Day, I, uh, the thing I took to heart big time was the core values uh, and the core values workshop. And um, it really helped me distill kind of the inherent value of myself, you know, what I had been valued for in my career, but then also gave me a great look at who the people I had surrounded myself with, like who were the people I was gravitating towards to want to be in my company and then pull out all of the, um, all of the real, like, you know, the inherent, the inherent core values of our company and, and organizing our sort of um, our team our culture, um, our KPIs, like sort of uh, so much of our hiring um, around around that has just been transformative. And I feel great, really just great cohesion within the company now because of that, uh, because of that tool. Interesting. So there you are, you're, you're scrapping together a team. You, you learn about core values. Now, did you have to let go of anyone? Did it change who you were about to hire? What did you... Yeah, it didn't. It, I didn't have to let go of anyone. We were small at the time, but mm -hmm. every hiring decision I've made since then has mm -hmm. relied heavily on the core values. And do, are it, like before, when somebody said, "Oh, are they a culture fit?" I didn't know what that meant. Like, what mm -hmm. is a culture fit? Like, I'm like, "Oh, do I like them? I can hang with anybody. I can have a beer with anybody." But when I had the core values as a guidepost, then it was like, "Oh, right. No, these are the things that we are really looking for in folks." Like these are the, these are the characteristics that are going to make them a great fit at the company. Yeah, that's well said. Um, and then, um, how do they show up today? Given that we've been through the pandemic and so on, how if I how do I see your business? How do I see the values in action? Oh yeah, well, um, I think one of our core values uh, that is really present is our help do good value. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we sort of recognize that as a production company, a production agency, you know, we're, we're helping tell stories. We're helping produce events, make videos, um, put on conferences, virtual conferences, VR experiences, wh whatever the case may be. But um, helping do good within that field is not, it's not a direct result. Like we are, we, we're sustainable and we, um, we offset all of our uh, carbon for the year. But what we're now doing is we're really targeting other companies that are helping do good. So we want to be the support system, the production company, the production agency for nonprofits, for mission-driven organizations, for uh, organizations in the sustainability, sustainability space, B Corps. You know, we want to focus our outreach and our storytelling capacity on the folks and on the companies that are doing good for the world. And so if we can play our part within that wider ecosystem, then we're going to be really feel fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So you're clear, clear and aligned then between the work you do, the people you do and the companies that you work with. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, exactly. And, and, and just in, in like real nitty gritty, mm -hmm. are you, are you working together in an office? Do you meet up at locations now? What does the business yeah. physically look like? Yeah. I mean, well, before we got, before the pandemic hit, we had a small office. We had just sort of like spun up the small office. So it was me and one other person who were in there daily. And then we'd have weekly meetings. And so we were starting to get like an office culture going and then shut down, uh, you know, about four months later. And, um, and then everybody just went remote. And I think mm -hmm. that one of the things that had made us so nimble, so agile early on was the fact that everybody was so comfortable with being remote kind of before and then during again, during the mm -hmm. pandemic. And now, now that that's happened, we're no longer, we're no longer like planning to have um, like a physical footprint. We're gonna have a, a small office. It'll still be a small office space. Maybe we'll have gatherings once a month, um, once once it gets back together. But, um, but 
the amazing thing that happened was that because we were remote, we saw each other more. I started instating much, much more frequent um, uh, rhythm of business. So like daily huddles were better attended. Um, weekly meetings are better attended. Monthly meetings and quarterly meetings, like all of these sort of like uh, rhythms of business were able to roll out uh, with a lot more ease when people were doing it on Zoom. Uh, and it's become a real like cornerstone of our, you know, sort of our business cultures that we're seeing each other every day. There's a lot of transparency to what everybody's doing. There's a lot of alignment with what our quarterly goals are, what our monthly goals are, because we're just talking about it regularly. Um, when we get back to live events and like we're doing in-person events, it's going to be interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm very curious to see like what that transition is going to be. And, um, and it's a, I mean, it's very important for me that we keep, um, to keep those rhythms going. And that's kind of what it looks like right now. You know, it's like we're, we're zoom Kings right now. Zoom Kings. Well, yeah, it's funny how some people, so some people, they moved into their garage, a closet, whatever, the corner of the house. Some people have uh, trucks and, and ambulances in the background. I get leaf blowers in this area. Uh, but this uh, used to be um, a kid's room a long, long time ago. Uh, across the room behind me were bunk beds um, and uh, be a very different display. It'd be kind of funny, actually, to throw the bunk beds back in behind me. But that's been a long time since that. Then it became kind of a little yoga room or whatever. And then, and then finally my office, but when the pandemic hit, right, I put in studio lighting in front of me and a better camera and better microphones and things like that and got ready for full, for full time zoom, Uh, which I, you know, I have mixed feelings about, um, about, abandoning and yet i do really enjoy it i was at a live event this last weekend and i saw a bunch of people and um we had masks but the vast majority of us were now vaccinated which is not the case all over the place but in certain areas it's starting to get very high right yeah yeah i mean we're already starting to see that push towards in person like we've got a few events that we're working on in uh late summer and in the fall and you know we really see that the the future is the future is likely going to be a hybrid, right? It's going to be, this virtual thing's not going to go away. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's brought too many people together. It's made it too easy uh, for us to just all get online and meet each other. It can, sure, it can improve. You know, we can always have a better experience online. But um, yeah, I just don't see it disappearing. And, uh, and which is actually kind of a great thing. I mean, for our business, I think it's kind of amazing that we're now... Um, we're now adding in this new uh, kind of revenue stream. You know, like now the virtual event is a thing. It wasn't before. Um, and then not only that, um, I think that it's going to like this hybrid, this sort of hybrid tweak that's going to happen is like now it's going to be, yeah, we're doing the live event and we're doing the virtual event. And so it makes sense. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's great. And I know this looks like a playroom, but this is actually my office. I just refuse to put books behind me. <laughs> So it's like I saw too many bookshelves, so I just filled it with toys and stuff. <laughs> so I, uh, it's funny, I, you got Kermit back there, and I have Elmo here, but Elmo has fallen way back behind my desk. Probably our housekeeper was here yesterday, so <laughs> I got knocked yeah, down. No, like, oh, I can't Elmo. get to Elmo right now. I was going to bring Elmo up to, to say hi. Oh, yeah, we could have a Muppet hello. Yeah, could have a little Muppet hello. Mm-hmm. All right, so um, it, uh, our show is called Getting Real. So Talk to us about your biggest screw up so far. What's the biggest mistake or regret that you've had uh, so far in, in growing your business? Yeah. yeah. I mean, honestly, like when I was getting started, I thought that I could just do it all by myself. Um, and I was super, I was super hesitant to like ask for help, um, to ask and seek out mentorship. I didn't know about like, I didn't know where the tools were to, um, to like learn how to do this business thing. I never went to business school. Like I'm a filmmaker. Um, and, uh, and like that sort of like freelance modality that kind of like, I'm an individual and I am my own person and no one can do it. Like I do it. And therefore I can't bring anybody into the tent because they're just going to mess it up. Like that, that holding on to that mentality really messed me up for a long time. And like, as soon as I sort of opened, opened the tent and like started looking at, you know, how to build a team the right way that everything just opened up for me. And, and the mentorship thing has been huge. Um, 
like I would, I would always talk about how like, God, you know, like, I just don't know who the heck to talk to about this stuff. You know, like, you know, nobody, none of my friends are starting businesses or none of my friends have a business and like, and, and, uh, all, all like, I didn't have any sort of like grown ups to reach out to. Um, and like, that's the, the EO network just blew my mind when, when, uh, when I got introduced to it for that, for that reason. Um, yeah. Realizing that every business is, every business basically has the same challenges. Again and again, look, there are different things in different industries about seasonality and your workforce and, and lots of things, but, um, but there's far more in common, right? It's funny that you say not finding members, not joining. And it, it seems bizarre that we wouldn't find a community that we wouldn't find. See, I said it would go in and out of focus. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> people are listening it right every now and then the focus like drifts. It like decides to focus on the back wall. Anyway, um, it's interesting to me that we don't find a community, we don't find mentors, we don't find coaches right away on the one hand. But if you think about it, it's not really that surprising because entrepreneurs are very much like, don't tell me what to do kind of people. I'm going to do it my own way. I think I have a better idea. So the notion that there's anybody else that could contribute to us that what, like there's a, there's a built in arrogance um, yeah, that, it's, that it's, we it's, grapple with. <laughs> yeah and like yeah it, it's like it's 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 like i've gotten this far like i yeah. it's like why can't i get further on my own and and uh and there's also like this competitive thing you know which i didn't realize was a thing and uh actually like recently i got introduced to this like this great this great concept of uh the competitive partner mm-hmm. um which uh which i was like oh right like that's who those are my industry friends <laughs> like those are the folks that i that I do actually partner with and that uh, we learn from each other and that we can actually right. tackle this thing together. It's like competition is like got this weird, can some, uh, can, it, it can have this weird hold on you when you're a freelancer and it, not something to shy away from really. All right. So I asked you what you've screwed up and, and it was good to share that, but what's a superpower that you have? What's something that you do like really well, maybe it's directly related to your work or maybe it's something quirky, but whatever it is, like, what do you think your superpowers are? Yeah. Um, I think my superpower is empathy. Um, mm-hmm. I think I care, you know, and I think that that's from being a freelancer where it's like, if this, if something goes wrong, it's you, it's all you, you know? And, uh, I think like when this is like one of the things that we as a company, I think do really well is that we listen to our clients. We listen to what they want. We don't just put what we think is best upon them but we really listen to what they're, what they want from us because, you know, there are a lot of different ways to produce an event. There are a lot of different ways to to make a video, to tell a story in a video. And, and if, and if we're sort of like uh, applying like a rigid kind of, Oh, well, this is how we do it kind of modality. Or like we walk into a show, like we're gunslingers, like, Hey, we've done like, we do these things all the time. We know exactly what we're doing. Like that doesn't fly. Like that, it turns off your client instantly. It it, tur- it shuts off your it shuts off my brain at least. Like whenever I see somebody like like that walk in, I'm like, no, thank you. And like and it, and when I when I feel myself drifting to that attitude, it's like, wait a second, I'm doing something that's not actually it to the value of my client. So having that empathy, that like listening empathy, and like thinking about what is really a value to other people um, outside and inside my organization has been. It's been really important. Um, mm-hmm. It's been really important. I, I, I think it was. I think it's my superpower, kind of in business and in life, in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, what's something that you could brag about? Hmm. Um, we produced events on every continent except Antarctica. Uh, there pretty, you go. That's pretty cool. Um, so I have a friend who's organizing a trip to Antarctica in December. I think you should get on that trip. I want that. I want that for me. <laughs> yeah. It could be like on every continent. That would be amazing. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Antarctica. I mean, I think I have to like somehow become like a scientist in order to do it, but I, I'll, I'll figure it out. It's fine. It's no, fine. it's just money. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. That's it. It's just money. It's like, I should have known better. Yeah. Yeah. Money can get you, now these days money could get you anywhere. You could go in orbit, you know, you're just willing to spend it. Up. That's right. That's right. Or, or, or win, win a contest. Right. And get yeah. on. And, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. 
So if you had to go back and do it again, what advice would you give your younger self to uh, do it better? Yeah, I mean, I kind of alluded to before, but like, don't be afraid to ask for help. I mean, I think that's been my, my fatal flaw for a long time. Um, and, uh, and don't be afraid to like hire and work with people who are better than you. Um, mm -hmm. at things, you know, like that's, I think that speaks a lot to the ego thing we were talking about before, you know, that sort of like arrogance and like, um, I think that when you have that humility that, Hey, there are people that are better than you at things. There are people that know, or that have been done this longer. I mean, then all of a sudden it's like, you just get elevated. You learn more, your company gets elevated by it. I mean, it's, a, uh, it's really nothing to shy away from. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's sort of a, yeah, that was my, that's the big, that's the big advice that I wish I, somebody had just taught me a long time ago. What are you most grateful for? Uh, I mean, uh, my family, my, uh, my wife, uh, without a doubt, who is like mm -hmm. the most supportive person. Um, and, uh, what I love about her is that she doesn't put the wrong kind of pressure on me. Um, mm -hmm. And she really, uh, she really like sees my, my happiness and fulfillment as the bottom line, like not some sort of weird external measurement. Like she doesn't, it's not about money. It's not about like, you know, the big show necessarily. It's about like, are you, are you personally fulfilled? Are you happy? Are, are you getting what you need out of this journey? Um, which has been a total, just an amazing focus, uh, focus for me, um, to not chase something external, um, as I'm on this, on this ride. Uh, what, what is the ride? Where are you headed? If you look out, what's your biggest long-term goal that you have, uh, either never spoken out loud or, or that you talk about, like whatever it is, whether yeah. it's public or not, what's the big long-term goal? I mean, gosh, you know, I think, um, the big goal that we have as a company is to just be like the first name on the lips of um, any nonprofit or mission driven company that's trying to make a piece of media, like an event, a video, anything. We want to be like the go to, the go to agency for that. Um, I think even bigger long term than that is like the, is the, is to grow a business to a place where we could actually, you know, sell or merge with, uh, with another company and make even bigger impact. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of way out there, but, um, it's definitely something that I didn't imagine even being on my radar, even like a couple of years ago. Um, but, uh, having started down this, like, uh, this real, like uh, scale journey of, um, of so what saleable a saleable business and top of mind to purpose centered organizations. Yeah. Yeah. As I think that like, if you're a sellable business you're a healthy business, right? Like it, it means that you've kind of got everything in line. Like, you know, it's a, uh, I don't have to be there every day. You know, I can, it, it, something can happen to me and it can still run without me. Um, which relieves the stress, like that, that reduces my stress level significantly. Um, and then, um, and then, and then really like helping just create more impact, you know, more positive impact in the world with the, with the work that we're doing. If you sold the business, what else would you do? Oh man, I just make movies all day, you know, <laughs> just make movies, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm a filmmaker at heart, which is, uh, you know, I'm still doing it. And it's funny. Cause like one of the reasons why I, uh, linked up with EO was because I was making a movie. I, um, I had this like passion project, a feature film that I've been working on for a little long time. And we actually raised the money for it. And I looked at the schedule and I was like, I'm going to be away from the company for like three months. I can't, first of all, independent films don't make any money. So I can't like just drop <laughs> what I'm doing and, uh, and become a filmmaker. But like at the same time, I really needed, wanted my company to survive those months without me. And so I like was in panic mode. I was like, what do I need to do? What do I need to put in place? So like, think about my systems processes, like infrastructure, like who do I need to have on board? And uh, yeah. And like ramped up in order to do it uh, in order mm -hmm. to make that film. And, and then, I mean, honestly, like, uh, yeah, if I could just be making like art films all day, I would just do it. I would just, uh, 
you know, do the red, make the red balloon, make the red balloon movies over again, you know, like go black and white, just be all artsy and just, you know, just get, just get wild. Yeah. Why not? Well, it's a, uh, it's been a good year for uh, companies like Netflix. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt. <laughs> and yeah. doc, almost yeah. anything entertainment, right? Give people something to do at home. Mm-hmm. It's working well this year. Yeah. Amen to that. So true. So true. So, um, uh, what do you think is your biggest challenge or barrier into becoming top of mind and creating a saleable business? What's the gap for you right now? Yeah. I mean, right now for me, it's just bandwidth. It's just like getting the right people in the door and getting the, uh, and then getting, getting the right, uh, so basically getting the right, the right capacity into our company and then actually doing a concerted effort on the, the outbound, like the outbound outreach. Um, we've really just been, uh, we've been scaling exponentially just based on word of mouth, just organic growth, which is the best way. I mean, it's the best mm-hmm. way to scale. I uh, love getting that warm email, that warm handshake intro. Um, but at the same time, we haven't really put a lot of effort behind like the, the growth modality. And um, we're like right there. Like I'm just, we're just making some big moves right now to help our infrastructure so that we can focus on that, on those sales. And then, um, yeah. And then uh, and I think with that, you know, we're going to, we're going to be well on our way, but uh, yeah, it's just a capacity thing, um, which is like, it's great. It's a great, <laughs> it's a great, uh, it's a great obstacle to have because it's solvable. Mm-hmm. So your, um, uh, if your superpower is empathy and storytelling, what's your weakness? What's your kryptonite, your Achilles heel? What do you struggle with uh, personally? Or what should you never be doing? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think I still can get dragged into the micro of projects uh, pretty easily. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm recently trying to move away from my own personal, like, investment into each individual project. Um, and that, uh, that's going to take some getting used to, um, to let go of the babies, you know, it's like to, to let them all walk on their own. Um, so yeah, I mean, I feel myself getting, you know, doing a little bit of micromanagement, not being as, uh, generous with my sort of, uh, open-ended question asking, about like, hey, what's going on here? What's the what's the thought process behind this? Um, and I think that's something I can definitely work on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. To be aware of both our superpowers as well as our weaknesses, to uh, and, and to have a handle on them. Um, I mean, not necessarily to overcome them, but to I think, understand. Them. I think that's it. I mean, I, I love to. I love to ask somebody else what that what it is. Well, I'm pretty sure your mom and your <laughs> wife could add things to that no, conversation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, uh, so before um, we say any more, I just want to remind folks that our episode is sponsored by the Bay Area Entrepreneurs Organization Chapters, EO Chapters are a member-led organization and the best place for entrepreneurs to find their peers, to connect and learn and grow uh, both the business and themselves as leaders. I've been a member for 21 years. I was just at an event this last weekend. I'll be going to another one. We're looking forward to having more and more events in person. Uh, As we're recording this now, we're planning a May sailing event. We've got a great speaker coming in July. We've got a Um, a retreat coming in June. We're going to do visit a business and do something fun and playful in the city in August, do this rally and these things called go cars. Um, So we do all kinds of cool things all the time. And then this week I'll be meeting with my forum uh, in our yard and our forum is now all vaccinated and feeling comfortable. So between being outside and, and vaccinated, we're meeting in person again. It's just fantastic to have that kind of group, a diverse group, different sized companies, different industries, different focuses, different family backgrounds. But we learn and support each other through all of that. So that's a little bit of what. And of course, we have an accelerator program in the Bay Area. I started that program years ago 
it's now been led by others because we're a member led organization and I've moved on to uh, doing other kinds of things. So if that's curious, learn, connect, grow, share experiences with uh, support each other, um, you should check it out. Um, you'll find all that at eonetwork.org. More information as well as if you'd like to apply or ask for a conversation about it, all that at eonetwork.org. Um, I want to thank Sean for coming on the show. You'll find Sean's information at sfgproductions.com. Sean, what well, sort of like how far and wide do you work? Is it all New York area or? We are uh, in you know, yeah. So you'll still yeah. do it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. We're still doing it. Um, you know, we, we really pride ourselves on just sourcing the best people and best gear around the world. And we've done, we've done events, um, all over the world, uh, to Perfect create centered storytelling. Yeah. Then there is in the crawl and in the show notes, Sean, SFG productions.com. Big thanks to Lucy Summers working in the background, queuing up titles, getting our shows scheduled, getting our guests prepared, getting the show produced and, and moved in and around. Um, also thanks to Vern Harnish, author and creator of the scaling up framework. Our show is edited by Albert Burge at Podfly Productions. Our show notes get written up by Ian Kudina and proofread by Tim McGowan. I want to thank everyone for listening, for watching, and I encourage you to keep scaling up. We'll talk to you again next time. <laughs> <laughs>